More than 24,000 hometown fans and millions more around the world tuned in for the beloved Hamilton Tiger Cats against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers for the Grey Cup. Mike Sherbino and his daughter Ashley were there in the freezing cold Canadian winter. Ashley surprised her dad with tickets and flew into town for the game. But of course, we all know the ending. But take heart, God is still in control. Assistant head coach of the Hamilton Ticats, who has a long history playing in football's big leagues, Mark Washington is here. Did you know his dad knew President John F. Kennedy and his brother Robert and worked years in the Navy and in the White House? Mr. George Washington. No, not that one, this George Washington. That's where Mark learned excellence. Mark lives and breathes football. And his Twitter tagline says it all. Love Jesus, family, you, and the Ticats. Today on The Perspective with Mike Sherbino and Julie Stoutland, the glory of God in sports. Hey, welcome to The Perspective today. I'm excited to do the program today. It's just kind of fun as we're talking about sports. Uh, and Julie, I know you're a big football player, right? Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes. Okay, Absolutely. question is, have you ever even held a football? Yes. No? no? Well, okay. You know, coming on the program today is Mark Washington, defensive coordinator for the uh, Thai Cats. He also played for the BC Lions. And the reason that that is good is that I've lived in both areas. At one time, I rooted for the Lions. Uh, I'm here now in St. Catharines area, so we root for the Thai Cats. I'm pulling for them. And I've lived in Winnipeg. And there was a short period of time when I rooted for uh, the Blue Bombers. But it was hard because it's so cold, I couldn't even clap my hands. So, like, <laughs> I got to be Canadian. The only thing I'm missing right now is my Tim Hortons cup. But I think Mark's got exactly. one. Exactly. You got to have Timmy's. <laughs> you know, Julie, one of the interesting things about sports today, and we're seeing it in the States, uh, we're seeing it here in Canada, that there's pushback against Christian players who want mm. to express their faith. And uh, I just want to do a shout out to any of them watching today to encourage them because we have a great God. I think one of the neat things with sports players, especially professionals who follow Jesus, that they realize that it's not in and of themselves. We can't do anything without the help of Jesus. We can't even take the next breath. Isn't that true? Absolutely. Absolutely right. We, we need to support them. They, they are faces for uh, Christianity in a totally different environment. And yeah, they need our support, absolutely. There's a lot of pushback about people expressing their faith. Uh, we're dealing with the whole secularism, especially coming out of Quebec right now and wondering, you know, if we can't show religious symbols, then there was even pushback about players, you know, raising their hand and giving credit to God for it. I think that we, we try to make this more complicated than it is. It's just a simple mm -hmm. way that these players are saying, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I recognize that everything that I do is for his glory. Um, and that's kind of the neat thing. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, my flashback is to Mark Liddell in the uh, 24 Olympics, you know, the great sprinter for England. And he said, when I run, I feel the, the power of God in me. And it was just oh. a powerful statement. And so we're going to come back. We're going to talk to Mark uh, Washington, yes. who's got a great story to share with us. We're looking forward to it. We're glad you're watching The Perspective today. Can you explain what the undefeated spirit and what that's all about? Because you know a little bit about being undefeated. Well, you know, undefeated spirit was an avenue that came up with a foundation I work with primarily in the States, but some went up up here. Mm -hmm. And if somebody wanted to go to the website, you go to undefeatedspirit.com. And the purpose was that was, uh, I kind of garnered that from the avenue of the Galatians uh, of uh, being uh, a solid believer and, and following the, the three things that, that are very important to me, my relationship with the Lord, my relationship with people, uh, and my relationship within myself. Mm. And, and have people understand that the undefeated spirit is about just not quitting. It doesn't matter what happens, you still keep on and go on another day. Well, hey, you spent 16 years with the BC Lions. Before that, a little run with the Alouettes. 
He was both a defensive coordinator and the coach, assistant coach for the Lions. And now he's a defensive coordinator with our beloved Hamilton Tiger Cats. I want to welcome Mark Washington. Mark, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. Yeah, I'm excited. I love talking about football. I played it a lot in high school, but I just wasn't good enough uh, to come up against you. I didn't want you to get, I didn't want to be hammered by you when I was trying to bust through. <laughs> no problem. Well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you had some experience on the field. So we, uh, we have something to relate, we can relate to. Yeah, well, we could tell a couple stories there, but that would just bore people. Um, okay. You know what? I got to go to the, uh, the football game. It was just a fun deal. As it said in the opener, my daughter surprised me and took me to the game. And we we're up at the top, and then we worked our way down. And we all know what happened in the game, but guys played so well. And, but what was interesting, Mark, for me was when the game was over and the Ticats had lost, the rowdy fans, <laughs> and that's a whole conversation in itself, Everything was just quiet, and they walked out. It was like a funeral. And I want to know this. What did you say in the dressing room and in the days to come to speak life back into the players? What, what did you do? Well, it, to be, it was very, very difficult. It wasn't easy at all. Um, it was one of – I felt low. I felt drained. I felt like I disappointed not only – um, the team and the organization, but also the city and the whole area. Um, but the thing is, the reality is, uh, whether we had won the game or we lost the game, the sun was going to come up the next morning. Um, and that it really didn't matter. We all start at the bottom of the mountain again, because our goal, your goal is to always to win the Grey Cup, to win the championship. And so you, you work, work all year, all off season, all during the season to get to that goal, to accomplish it, to, to win the game. But then the day after the game, really, the, yes, you're, the team is still celebrating or one team is still sort of in mourning. But the reality is now the climb starts again. And so um, we had to remind our players and I had to remind myself several times that, you know what, now we have to start trying, you know, to accomplish and win in the 2022 Great Cup. Oh, I and love that. that. Is that's what my plan is. And so, yeah, you get to be the champion and congratulations to Winnipeg. I give them all the credit in the world. They came back and they won. They've earned it. Um, and, and But yet at the same time, you know, I had to encourage myself by saying, you know what, Mark, either way, win or lose, you have to start that climb again. And you know what, we, we did have, I look back at it, you know, the season had all kinds of challenges and things like that, but we came back. Uh, we, we were here. We were able to host a great cup. I think I believe the fans had an outstanding time until the last couple of minutes of the game. Hey, you know what? It, it was good. Uh, but like you say, there is no great cup. There is no Stanley Cup. There's no Super Bowl that's ever stayed one. You got to start the next day. Right. I want I want to ask you a question because the interview is going to go so quick. You were inspired by a man of greatness. Your dad, George Washington. Give us a snippet of this amazing guy. And uh, I shared with you earlier just how something he said has just spoken life into me actually today. Talk to us about your dad. Well, my dad, uh, to me, he was just my dad. I, did, I didn't know a lot of the things that he accomplished until later in life, right before he, he passed, a couple years before he passed away. Uh, I knew that my dad uh, had worked in the White House. I knew that, you know, he had worked with Kennedy and he had worked with um, uh, Johnson those two administrations as a photographer there in the White House. But the details and all that type of thing, I didn't quite know everything that he had done. Um, you know, my, my dad was a humble guy in that he didn't walk around bragging, saying that he knew all these things and he did all of these things. He was he just went to work every day. And so, man, he was an inspiring man because, you know, he wasn't supposed, he lived till he was 81 years old. He wasn't supposed to live that long. Um, he was in a terrible accident when he was five years old and he lost, uh, he, he lost his right leg. He, his right, right leg was amputated. And the way the, the amputation went and the surgeries and things, they didn't expect him to make it, you know, the last few weeks. And he ended up making it for a lot longer than that. And then having the, the type of life and the career that he did. So I'm extremely proud of him. Uh, when I see him, you know, growing up, all I saw was that. But then uh, over time, you begin to really appreciate the work ethic and the dedication he had to our family and uh, how hard he worked. And I believe, you know, some of those traits, I pray that some of those traits have, have rubbed off on me and I'm able to pass those on to my kids also. Man, that, that, that's, 
it's such a great story. I want you to come back. We're going to unpack it more in another time. But I know that spoke into your life as you processed the loss. But prior to the Grey Cup, you also had participated in something called the Prayer Breakfast with Athletes in Action. And it's a time when people come together. What's the purpose of a prayer breakfast uh, before a football game? Just tell us about that and what God is doing with many other athletes. Well, the week of the Grey Cup is an extremely busy week for the players and, and for the coaches. And I think it's important for us to take the time to set us, set us up some time away to say, listen, God, I want to bring you on. I want to bring you glory. And I want to pray. And I want to pray to you. I want to pray with my teammates and with the other coaches. And then I also want to pray with the other team. And so the Grey Cup breakfast over the years has been uh, used by Athletes in Action to not only reach out to to uh, other people and the, the believers and non-believers and then to bring them together the day before the Grey Cup, but it's to also show that win or lose, you know, we got two opposing teams, but all glory is going to go to God at the end. Hey, I love that. So let me just take it another little twist as we wrap up this part of the interview. Um, not all the players that you coach and work with are followers of Jesus, at least not yet. But what do you try to speak into their lives? How do you try to, what would be one thing you would say to them, you know, when, when they gather together in the spring for training camp, how are you going to speak into their life? Well, one, I'm a coach. I'm a coach. I'm a coach them hard. You know, I coach them hard because that's my job. But also this Christian life is to be lived, is to be spoken, and is to be lived and experienced. And so I want them to see that I am different, not because of me. I'm different because of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that he is the center of my life. He's the top of it. And that this Christian life is possible. You can be a professional athlete. You can be a coach and still live the Christian life. And you can live it till its fullest. Wow. Love that, Mark. We're going to be right back as Julie's going to ask you some questions. And as we go to the break, is there any chance that I could play for the Ticats this year? No. Not yet. <laughs> I was using people to reach me at the lowest point in my life and giving me father figures and big brothers in the faith to pour into me. And they just discipled me. They taught me how to memorize scripture. They taught me how to share my testimony. They taught me how to read the Bible. And um, the more that I learned it, the more that I was getting the word in me, I started to become stronger. And I started to find my identity in Christ. And it got to the point where I didn't even care about playing football no more. I just wanted to tell people about this life-changing experience that I received because I've never felt anything like this in my life before. Welcome back. We're talking with Mark Washington, the de defensive coordinator and defensive backs coach of the Hampton Ticats. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Mark. I, I want to jump right in here and say, you know, in the world of professional sports, I can only imagine what kind of pressure players put on themselves to achieve. Um, how much coaching do you do off the field? I'm sure the pressure shows up in many different ways. Well, we, we pride ourselves here in Hamilton uh, to not only coach the player in the field, but more importantly, to coach the man. You know, we say if you reach the man, he can help him reach his potential. And so we invest in people because at the end of the day, uh, it isn't a robot that goes out there on the field. It's a human being. It's a man. It's a person. It's a, it's a husband. It's a father. You know, it's an uncle, a brother, or whatever. These men are the ones taking the field. And so you want to make sure that that man is, is doing well inside. And when, he's, when the man is doing well, then football will go well along with it. So we encourage them uh, a lot, you know, and, and many guys come into our office and you know, they want to talk football, but eventually we end up uh, speaking on life. And when you speak on life, really, that's the effect that you really want to have. Because when you look at it in the grand scheme of things, football is only going to be a short episode in their life. And it may be a, a significant one, but it's really a short episode in their life. But more importantly, the things that really last, the things that are worth anything are, are their ability to be a, a man, to be a man of God, if they are, and to be a great uh, husband, a great father, a great citizen. Right. You know, I love the fact that you say that they're not uh, a robot. You know, they may be a team player, maybe a part of the team, but they still are an individual, someone who God loves individually. I think that's a really great point to make. Um, I want to ask you, how do you describe success personally? 
Uh, well, I believe success is accomplishing what I, I guess God has set out for you. Um, I believe success has a lot of different, uh, a lot of different uh, realms, I guess you can say. Uh, I, I look at, I look at my savior, I look at Jesus and people will say, you know, the, I remember when, when, when Jesus was on a cross and they were saying you were able to save all these other people and yet you can't save yourself because you're on a, you're dying. But they didn't understand what success was going to mean. You know, he had to be there. He needed to be there. It was important for him to be there. The fact that he was there was going to save our lives. And so that is ultimate success. And so and I have to always look at, say, all right, God, what is it that you want to accomplish in this thing? Because I could, I, we could win the great cup and then miss the boat on something else. And, and that, that won't be the ultimate success that we want to experience. Now, do I want to win the great cup? For, yeah, of course, you know, that's what I want. That's what I was saying, you know, and are we going to work hard to do that? Of, of sure, of, of course, of course. But we have to under, also understand that, you know, God has a lot of different plans and all these plans are all tied in together. We're all sort of linked in together in God's ultimate plan. And I want to make sure that he says, well done at the end of the day. Exactly. I absolutely agree. So what about on the flip side? How would you describe failure? I would just say the exact opposite of that. You know, if I don't accomplish what God has set out, you know, um, that's failure. You know, there are objective failures and things like that. We failed to win the Grey Cup this year. All right. That that's that make obviously that makes sense because the Grey Cup is over in Winnipeg. It's not in this building here. And so we failed to do that. But if I don't accomplish what God has wanted or in the way that he wanted me to do it, then there's some failure there. You know, um, there there are a lot of different ways to get things done, but you got to make sure that you, they're being done and they're being accomplished the right way. You know, I learned a lesson a few years ago, and I'm not even sure where I got it from. But, I, you know, I heard someone say, and it made all the sense in the world to me, never replace right with good. So I can do good things, but yet they're not the right things to be done. And so I always try to focus on doing the right thing, not necessarily the good thing. Wow. I love that. Never replace the right with good. That I have to remember that. That is awesome. So doing the work you do, what is your go-to scripture? I know that I have one personally, but what is yours? One that you really hang on to? Well, I believe it sort of, it, it may change with the season that I'm in um, and, and where I am. Uh, the one thing that I really hung my hat on this past year is, is, uh, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, right? Mm. I don't know. It just kept coming up, you know, when things would, when history or things in my past would try to come back and try to say, oh, mark this and try to, you know, not even tempt me, but try to pull me down and, and try to, you know, try to deter me a little bit. I had to remind myself, no, no, wait a minute. I'm a new, I'm a new man, I'm a new man in Christ. All right. All that old stuff is exactly that. It's old stuff. It's done. It's over with. But now I have to focus on where God has me now, where he's taking me in the future. And I'm a new man with new equipment, with new purpose, with new focus, with new energy and a new power and a new presence and a, and a new ability to get to get the things that God wants me to get done and done. You know, and I think that's so awesome because it, when you walk with Christ in this life, I find that it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. There's always a time when we can renew our minds and come back to something that we've known before and we have to refresh ourselves on something. And I think that's great because we're always learning. We're never stopping. Sometimes it's, it has to come back to the forefront again. And I think that's great that you, you mentioned that, that this is, you went through minor says we're a new creation in Christ. Um, I, I want to ask you this too. What is the biggest way you practice your faith on the field and off the field? Uh, living, living it, understanding that um, Christ is my source. He's my life. You know, um, I want to show that Christ isn't just a part of my life, that he is actually my life. He is it. Um, we, we, have, we have the ability to compartmentalize our lives and say, this is my work life, my family life, my spiritual life, and, and you know, so on and so forth. But that's, I don't believe that's the way God wanted us to live. He is our life. He is everything and everything else, whether it be work, family, whatever, it stems from the life that we get in Christ Jesus. So he's the center. He's the source of it all. And I want to live that every single day. And when people see that, they understand, they see the power of Christ 
And then that's when I'm accomplishing what God wants. Well said. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Mike's Word. Can you explain what the undefeated spirit and what that's all about? Because you know a little bit about being undefeated. Well, you know, undefeated spirit was an avenue that came up with a foundation I worked with primarily in the States, but some went up up here. Mm -hmm. And if somebody wanted to go to the website, you go to undefeatedspirit.com. And the purpose was that was uh, I kind of garnered that from the avenue of the Galatians uh, of uh, being a solid believer and, and following the, the three things that, that are very important to me, my relationship with the Lord, my relationship with people, uh, and my relationship within myself. Mm. And and have people understand that the undefeated spirit is about, it's not quitting, it doesn't matter what happens, you still keep on and going another day. You know, there's something beautiful when a team functions together. And the Bible talks about the church in a similar way. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, 4 to 6, we read, there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And through the course of this week, as we continue to unpack the teachings about the church, is it relevant? We want to talk today about what it is that we believe. We've been listening to Mark Washington, and he's been unpacking what he believes and how that shapes what he does in professional sports, but also in his personal life uh, as a father and uh, as a husband, and then of course, as a coach. And so we take that analogy and we try to work it as best we can, but we come to the scriptures, which gives us a more beautiful picture. It talks about why God loves the church, why it is so important to him. And if we were to understand why the church is important, we need to understand what is core. What is it that we need to believe in? Any coach will tell you that the team has to know what they're aligned in, what they believe in, what are their core values. And so the reason that I love the local church and what God is doing through his universal church is because of what are the essentials, the key things. Sometimes with my wife, when we would pack up to go away on a trip, her idea of the essentials and mine we're miles apart. And uh, while we could, you know, go into that whole area, we'd probably need a marriage counselor to get out of it. But we all understand the importance of essentials. I want to share with you today two essentials about what we believe. And they're found in our understanding of the doctrine that is called the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three aspects of God in one, all equally important all equally of the same rank. Jesus was God, the Holy Spirit is God, and the Father is God. It's hard for us to understand, but like many things in life, we do not fully comprehend them. I'm not an electrician. I know enough about electricity to know that if the wires are running right and you turn on the switch, there's going to be a light. But if I'm to explain it much further than that, I'd be stumbling and faltering. When it comes to the greatness and the magnitude of God, I've learned this about what it is that I believe, that I have a heavenly father who cares for me. And if I talk about the essentials and the uniqueness of the Trinity, here's the first thing. My father in heaven has planned my salvation. I read in Ephesians 1 verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. What does that mean that he chose us? In that passage in the book of Ephesians, he talks about how God's predestined us. It means to map life out with the boundary, that he's adopted us, the, the idea of choosing us and that we are unique. Talk to any parent who's adopted a child and they will say, as I picked out that child, as I chose that child, it was because of my love, the immediate heartfelt connection. In the same way, if we understand the Trinity, we have a God who has planned our salvation. Sin has separated us from him. He wants us to be together with him. And God went to all lengths to make it possible for us to come into his family. The beautiful picture of being chosen reminds me that even in the midst of those difficult times, I can trust him. I think of the, the woman in the wheelchair, Joni Erickson, 
Tata, who shared this interesting comment. She said, when she became a quadriplegic at the age of 17 as a result of a diving accident, she said, if God had told me some time ago that he was about to make me as happy as I could be and told me that he'd begin by crippling my arms and limbs and removing from me all my usual sources of enjoyment, I would have thought that so strange, a way of accomplishing his purpose. And yet, how is his wisdom manifest in this? And she says, if you should see a man shut up in a closed room, idolizing a set of lamps and rejoicing in their light, and you wanted to make him really happy, well, what would you do? And she said, you begin by blowing out the lamps and then throw open the shutters to let in the light of heaven. And when we understand that God has chosen us, that he's walking with us, whatever it is we're going through, whatever the illness or the tragedy or the crisis, we can rest in the assurance as we understand the Trinity that God the Father has chosen us. He has a plan for our life. And part of that plan was fulfilled through Jesus the Son in paying for our salvation. Because it says, the Bible says, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The idea of redemption is being, our a price is being paid. We were slaves on an auction block and God has brought us back into his family. Now, these essentials, are they in your head or in your heart? When we understand God's love for us and the extent to which Christ has gone to pay the price for our sin, we can have hope and we can live the life that he's called us to live, knowing that we are the children of God. You know, Mike, you made me re- think a, a time when I was a teenager and a speaker shared with us his idea of how the Trinity could be explained. And it always stuck with me. It was, he talked about how if you had a cherry pie and you cut it into three, that knife would cut through and all the liquid of the cherry pie would still go through. It was one pie, but now it was cut into three. And in the same way, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are three, but still one. And I thought that was a unique way for my brain to try to hang on to that. And, and on that thought as well, I thought about the fact that, you know, we have to have it in our head knowledge and we have to have it in our heart and how important it is. You talk about both. We need to have knowledge, but knowledge is enough. And if we just have an emotional experience, that's not enough. It's the marriage of the two. It's the flow of the two together that give us those essentials as we walk in Christ. You know, that's a uh... A great analogy that you've made, Julie, and I've thought of other analogies as well, but it seems that at the end of the day, that's the best that they are. They're analogies. They fall short. And there's a point where we have to come and say, do I trust? What is it I'm going to believe? And many people say, well, I can't enter into the fact that God the Father, God the Son, and the Spirit are one. I'm going to continue to teach on that this coming week, but here's the choice. If we can't trust that, who are we going to trust in? And so as always to our viewers today, can I invite you to take that step of faith and place your trust in Jesus, invite him to be your leader and Lord, the change will be supernatural.